So I told, I told Matt it's going to be 45 minutes. He told me fit it in 23 minutes. So we're going to try, we're going to, try to do that. Um, so first of all, OpenTable. Um, how many people here use OpenTable? OK, my job here is done. I'm, I'm done. I mean, nothing, more, nothing more to say. Um, OpenTable is, is pretty big today. It's about 32,000 restaurants. So we provide software that sits inside those restaurants and allows restaurants to manage their inventory, inventory being uh, seats at the table. Uh, so any person who walks into that restaurant, who calls that restaurant for reservation, who makes reservation online, they all would end up in that system. Uh, and essentially, that's the, pro that's the product that we have. So our product is real-time availability um, inside those restaurants. We, we sit about uh, 16 million diners a month, so it's a, kind of a lot going on there and um, uh, we international as well. Uh, now, um, when we look at what we do, uh, when we look at what we do, we ultimately there to help you find, find the right uh, dining experience for your event, for work, for date, for whatever it is. And there's many, there are many ways to do it, but um, at the core of it, we need to understand what the diner, we need to understand what diner wants, their preferences, how they look at their dining experience. But we also need to understand the restaurant and what restaurant uh, tells about themselves, how they perceive themselves, uh, and kind of what are they selling, what experiences, what hospitality are they providing. Uh, now, not necessarily those two things are always uh, the same. Uh, the way restaurants talk about themselves is not always how diners view them. And many times it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually interesting that restaurants are not even thinking about certain things, that diners who go there uh, express themselves um, kind of on social media and in reviews and in all kinds of areas about that restaurant. So, so, and then we would try to take that and provide it back to the restaurant. Uh, and you guys will see in a second what, what I mean. Um, so uh, data, so here's how, gen generally speaking, this is how we organized. Uh, all of our events flowing through Kafka, they've been populated into Cassandra, Cassandra, which then we run Spark instances that kind of model on top of the data. We also store it in S3 for um, kind of more long-term processing and uh, trying to get some insights out of it. Um, but that's generally, and we use Databricks infrastructure to, for, to run Spark, so that, that's generally what we do in our, in our data science group. Uh, not, um, a lot of, uh, not a lot of interesting things here, pretty, pretty, pretty standard stuff. Now, um, uh, now, what data we actually have in our possession to create interesting experiences or models or, or, or whatever? So we have... Uh, tons of reviews. Uh, we have 30 million reviews um, in, in our uh, kind of in our database. We have menus of restaurants. We have ratings. Ratings are important. Uh, again, we'll talk about it in a second. Why ratings are important. Um, we have diner requests and notes. So people that put notes when they make a reservation. I want a table by the window. I want. Uh, um, I want a certain type of food, I have certain type of allergies, there's all kinds of things that people put in. Um, and we have searches, and we have searches, which is people search, that's an intent. Uh, people do multi-searches, where they just show me anything that's available for, that's good for Valentine's Day in my neighborhood. Those are kind of multi-search intent. Um, so we try, we try to take all of that, and we try to do something useful with it. Um, now, we're gonna start, I'm going to start compar com uh, kind of compartmentalizing things into different buckets. And so one bucket is diner restaurant interactions. This is kind of where ratings, searches, reviews, all going to go into that bucket. Then we have restaurant metadata, and that would be everything that restaurant describes about themselves. So this would be what kind of cuisine you are. Um, what kind of uh, price range you're in. That's, that's, that's an important one. And then we're going to have user metadata. And so that's something that users, um, again, either put in the notes or say about themselves or kind of their history, uh, etc. 
Now, when, when our team, uh, when our data science team started to look at actually the corpus of what we have to work with, um, they discovered that unlike some other services, uh, we have something unique, and that is not only restaurants have thousands of reviews per restaurant in many cases, but the reviews are uh, actually, some of them are pretty long. And that's fantastic, because the more textual information people put in, the more we can extract out of it. That means the more, well, for us, it also means the more they engage with the product and the more they're willing to describe what they do. Um, one thing about OpenTable, which is actually pretty interesting, and that is every review that a person leaves, they only allow to leave if they, we know for a fact that they actually dined in that restaurant. Because our system sits inside the restaurant, and in our system, when you walk in, a hostess says, okay, uh, you are table 34. Uh, she actually creates certain actions inside the system to seat you at table 34. That's verification for us. That means a person was seated at, uh, in this restaurant. Only after that fact, we allow them to leave a review. That means every review is actually verified that a person been there. It's not some kind of a cousin down, you know, my cousin down the road who tries to leave a review about my neighbor, that my neighbor sucks. None of that. Um, well, at, uh, let's put it this way. At least if they want to leave a review about the neighbor, they have to go and spend money there. So that's like the, the minimum they can do. Um, okay, so that's good. Now, um, uh, when we planned this whole exercise, we kind of sat and discussed with the team what are the different themes that, we want, that most likely things will fall into. And that is important, I think, because we didn't just let uh, many things that we're doing, we, it's, it's a kind of modeling machine learning exercises, but it also has a layer of kind of a manual cleanup or an organizing to it. Um, which is, this is essentially the five things that our restaurant's telling us uh, that they care about and that we feel that diner care about as well. Those would be food, actual food, the ambience, the service that's been provided, value for money, and also how good they are in accommodating special occasions or special requests. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we've done with the reviews. Um, so we went through the following process. We, we took uh, kind of the corpus of reviews by different geographies. That's important. What people do in San Francisco is not necessarily how people do it in New York, nor necessarily how people uh, talk about food in London. Uh, we classified them. Uh, we broke those reviews into topics. We classified those topics into categories based on what I just described in a previous slide. And then we mapped those topics back to restaurants to see what actually restaurants, now what, in what topics they actually fit based on the reviews that people left there. And then we went through a process of understanding what reviews are actually more or less relevant to the diner and kind of tried to surface that up. A um, little bit of math here, so non-negative matrix factorization uh, allowed us to break things into just make them much simpler and uh, um, find topics easier. Um, and then we, um, we came with the following. So topics actually became pretty clean and they, fed, they, they kind of fell very nicely into the categories uh, that we have. So you would see in the food, you would see things like steaks, rare, medium, etc. In wine, you would see words like glass and pairings. Uh, music would be ja uh, kind of jazz. So, um, uh, oops. Um, as well as, uh, hold on, what happened here? Here. As well as uh, topics fell into the uh, also value and service and occasions. So while, once we had that, uh, a couple other things uh, became pretty, pretty interesting to do. So we, we, then we, we, we took every restaurant, we looked at all the reviews that they have, we looked how um, how highly certain topics uh, score in that review. Uh, and we kind of averaged everything out to come up with what this restaurant is really all about. So uh, based on the, cor on the full corpus of, of their reviews. Um, what was interesting that we discovered is that many things that restaurants talk about themselves about, like for example, this restaurant, 
uh, all they talk about in their description is steaks and meat. Um, but if you look at the bubbles and the size of a uh, and the size of a bubbles, uh, a lot of uh, people talked about salad. This, uh, how great it was, and they enjoyed it, etc. A lot of people talk about the bar. Uh, lunch was a pretty big one. This restaurant, when we presented it back to them, they never even considered that the salads were that great, and they didn't even understand that that's what people care about. Um, or, for example, the, uh, this fish place. So they talk about fish, crab, uh, local seafood. Um, but actually what diners care about a lot was a bay, which is a view of a bay and uh, how close to the bridge it was, how, what, what, uh, what the views from the restaurant were. So diners considered much more of a destination for a great view rather than uh, a dish with crab or uh, uh, with some seafood. So um, all those things uh, be became pretty interesting to us. So then we started to look at the different metros and, and see how um, how diners kind of describe uh, different met what's important in, in every metro. So, for example, you can see in San Francisco, people talk a lot about the view um, uh, of the bay, the view of the bridge. In New York, people talk about uh, a view of the river or view of the Hudson. Uh, while in Chicago, uh, people talk about the city and, and and the lake. Now, all that is why is it all that important? Because we take that. And we try to package it back. Now we know how to talk to the diners about a particular place. We also can teach our restaurants how to market on, on, uh, themselves on uh, using words and descriptions that they wouldn't think about otherwise. Um, even nuances across, uh, across continents became, became kind of interesting. Um, well, in London, people talk about uh, brunch and roast, and in U.S. cities, people more talk about uh, mimosas and uh, kind of doing things on Sunday. So, okay. Um, so then, um, also a couple other fascinating things came out. Uh, Valentine's Day, uh, hugely polarizing activity for whatever reason. Uh, some people love it, some people hate it. Like what? what I, I assume it has to do with how the night ended, but. Uh, um, but we, but we get a lot of that. So, our literally it's our most polarizing day uh, on reviews basis, based on one star review versus five star reviews. So on one, like on one side, uh, people would talk about uh, they didn't like their steak, and the kind of, when we looked at the corpus of one star reviews, a lot of it was about the steak. Um, weird. When we looked at the corpus of the five star reviews, a lot of it was about steak. And we're like, so, okay, um, I guess steak is really important on Valentine's Day. Um, we actually uh, tested this message, message back with, with a whole bunch of restaurants, and we said, all you have to do on Valentine's Day is to get the steak right. Like, you do that, you're golden. Uh, and they reported back to us that it was phenomenal success. Like, they instructed the waiters to talk about steaks, and, they, da, 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 and, and people loved them, tips were higher, like, it was crazy. So... Uh, nobody would even think about it unless you actually can analyze some kind of how people talk about uh, things in context. Okay, uh, a couple other things I wanted to, wanted to cover with you guys. Um, dish tags. So um, another thing we would try to do is to actually analyze reviews to extract um, the names of dishes as diners describe them. And then... Um, uh, try to kind of disambiguate uh, the same words that people use to talk about the same, uh, different words that people use to talk about the same dish. Uh, we, use, we would use those things in when we tie them back into photos, and so then we can present actually here the popular dishes in this restaurant. Uh, but also, um, what we try to do is to actually be smart about it and um, uh, and you use kind of n-gram analysis rather than one gram or two gram uh, to see that certain dishes, um, they spend multiple words. And that was kind of not an easy thing to do. Um, how people uh, describe things, how people talk about things, word in context, out of context. Um, but a couple interesting things came out there as well. For example, New York City, just looked, looked it up before I came to speak here. 
Um, there's a huge trend in cauliflower. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but like, I mean, look at this graph. Like, I can't make this stuff up. Uh, um, and all those words that you see, all those dishes, uh, all picked up out of recent reviews uh, in the last several months about New York City restaurants. Uh, what's with the cauliflower? I don't know. But I do know that when we go back then to restaurants and they say, do you have a cauliflower dish or you don't, something is wrong with you. Uh, and um, so they appreciate that feedback for sure. Um, artichokes are trending apparently as well. Um, okay, uh, a couple other things. Um, um, restaurants also use attributes about themselves. So as you can see on the bottom of this iPhone screen, outdoor sitting, fun, all those things uh, are being generated automatically. So that allows us to create those kind of product features, extracting the words out of reviews, how diners talk about the restaurants, taxonomizing them, and then spitting them out in uh, kind of as a notable four section, which uh, produced also great results for us. So um, we allow people to click on those and so we can see more restaurants that fit into kind of those kind of tags. We also create pro uh, diner profiles. So, um, so me, myself, personally, my profile is not that interesting. Obviously, I eat kosher, so that limits my choices by like to a lot of a uh, very small subset. However, um, for every diner, we could, we could create a profile which would be um, uh, kind of a specific not only to the restaurants they went to based on the history, but also to the reviews that they're leaving and how they talk about food. So if we can then take that, package that back into marketing or personalization efforts within the apps, um, we, we see much higher engagement when we actually take those uh, into accounts in our modeling. Sentiments. Um, so when we, use, when we see words inside reviews, that's where we take into account, was it a one-star review, was it a five-star review, to understand was the sentiment negative or positive about similar words. So service is a service, but was it a good service or a bad service, we can extract out of the, out of the kind of how many star reviews are being given there. So those would be more negative sentiments um, that we take into account as well. Um, then we take uh, everything I talked about reviews, we take those sentiments, and now we know was the, this particular sentence in review, was it the negative sentence, was it the positive sentence? We can extract the snippets out of positive sentences and put them in the um, restaurant profile page when the diners can kind of quickly glance and understand um, what this restaurant is all about. Um, it's interesting because we started, uh, the model started to get smarter. So the model started to understand things like to die for, crispy and moist are all positive words which wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily understand otherwise. Um, and lastly, um, uh, lastly uh, so just in, in kind of intent out of the reviews. Um, again, guys, couldn't make this stuff up. This is real. Um, uh, people becoming so specific into what they want, um, it's kind of a scary. If it's all possible, we'd like a waiter with a ponytail. I mean, seriously, what's up? Uh, draw a poppy on a piece of paper. Uh, and um, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but, uh, but it actually also gives actually very deep insight into, into last 10 years of human psyche. People used to, people used to be very generic. Uh, people used to say in our reviews, and that's the beauty of the fact that we have 15 years worth of them. People used to say, I just want a booth. Um, uh, uh, sorry, people used to say, I just want to be a romantic setting, or I want to have an intimate place. Now people are saying, I want a booth. I want a flowers. I want a waiter with a ponytail. And, um, uh, and again, this is interesting because uh, the, our customers becoming more demanding. Our customers require much more precision in the service and in the hospitality that restaurants provide to them, which means we can take that and present that to, the, to restaurants with, hey, you should pay attention much more to actually the specific in the note, specifics in the notes, how customers trying to talk to you. Uh, uh, we, we had this restaurant uh, from Chicago who was visiting us, and um, they said that 
uh, the best hospitality they can provide is when they learn something about the diner. So, um, example that, that he brought is that we, he got a diner from Open Table, and um, he was able to find this diner on Twitter. He was an executive in a company. Uh, he tweeted that morning that uh, he feels under the weather, um, but then he shows up in the restaurant with the, obviously for a business meeting. And so the restaurateur uh, went to the table and said, um, uh, I know, Mr. So-and-so, uh, that you, you weren't feeling good this morning, so typically we pair our dishes with wines, but for you, the chef prepared a special pairing with teas. Um, and uh, that person, that executive, walked out of that restaurant. Uh, not only he left a glorious review, but he tweeted and emailed to all his buddies, and uh, it's the most amazing place in the world. Restaurants look seeking for that. They're looking for that to be able to provide that hospitality. We look at ourselves as the kind of a marketplace of all that information. And so the more we can package it and back, give it back to restaurants, the better the hospitality they'll provide, the more customer will be happy, and kind of everybody wins. That's it. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll pass on the mic to people here, but uh, what, what does a data science team look like, or who, who does all of this? Um, so a data science team, in our case, it's um, uh, six data scientists, um, as well as uh, several data science, uh, what we call data science engineers. And so on the engineering side, uh, those would be folks who would be moving data around and creating all this infrastructure, and data science would be the guys who are actually uh, modeling for things, uh, developing personalization engines, uh, trying to find interesting uh, tidbits of information inside data, um, and work, ultimately working with the business. So one thing which is um, we try to be very, um, very hard about is that whatever we do, it ultimately needs to be solving some kind of a problem in a business. Problem in the business doesn't mean necessarily for open table. Problem for our customers, for diners, for restaurants. Um, so we look at a more pragmatic approach to data science, and, and um, that's on one side. Lastly, data science team would be working on things like inventory optimization inside restaurants. So that's also, I didn't touch on that area at all, but it's a big area of how the tables and slots of tables should be allocated. You know, if a restaurant opens from 6 to 9 and somebody takes a 7 p.m. reservation, they essentially block that restaurant for the whole night rather than somebody would take a 6 o'clock or 8 o'clock and then a restaurant can fit two parties that night at the same table. So th th all those kind of problems are all ultimately would fall into the data science group. That's new. You have some of that. You have stuff like weather prediction, how they may impact whether people show up or not. Or yeah, so th this, is, this is also an interesting area. There's many, we are tremendously um, events and weather affected business. So, uh, be it a storm somewhere, or be it even, uh, you know, um, I don't know, game seven and NBA finals. Uh, like all those, like San Francisco will be dead, you know, if it's going to go to game seven. Like, so, uh, it's, um, all those things have been, uh, we've been affected by, and we try to provide the, those insights back to restaurants um, so they'll be able to plan better. Ultimately, restaurants are a tough business because it's a kind of a fixed cost business. You know, you have the rent, you have the people, you have food. If people don't show up, you're taking that loss. So our job is to optimize that as much as we can. Cool, thanks. I'm gonna open up to questions and since Andrew's downstairs now. Could you, if you're willing, could you comment on your revenue model? It sounds like you consult quite a bit with the restaurant, so it'd be interesting to see how that all fits together. Sure. Um, uh, our revenue uh, comes from two sources. Uh, restaurants pay um, some subscription fee to use our software, um, and as well as restaurants pay per diner fee when they come from Open Table Network. So if somebody uh, makes a reservation at opentable.com or through one of our partners, uh, typically restaurants pays a dollar per person. Uh, and that's just kind of, we look at it as a marketing expense on what we do on behalf of those restaurants. Um, and the subscription fee is just to, for use of the software um, that they get, and uh, so so that's majority of our revenue comes from the dollar per person, which is that's how we like it because that is per performance. Like we put seats in the uh, people in seats, and that's why you pay us. One in the back. I'm sorry. 
It might be limited, but uh, open table pay is still pretty new. Uh, any new kind of interesting insights that you guys have mined from that? Um, so open table pay, for those of you who don't know, that's a kind of an experiment we're running where you can pay um, for your check at the table uh, without even talking to a waiter. At the moment you sit down, you get notification on your phone saying, hey, we know who you are, we matched your check. Anytime you're ready to pay, just, just swipe this thing, you see a check with descriptions, you say 15% tip and you walk out, sort of like Uber, if you will. Um, and uh, we have, at this point, we have uh, hundreds of restaurants who are running on that. Uh, we have fantastic, really, engagement. Anybody who tries it, uh, they just like, it's, it was amazing. Because this is one of those things where we try to understand what is the pain point in the dining experience. And and seems like people talk about the most, the pain point is waiting for the check. Uh, I'm done with the conversation. I just want to leave, and I have to sit and wait. And then the waiter goes back with a credit card, whatever. So, so we try to solve that. Uh, part of it is just evolution for us to become more of an experience company rather than purely transactional company. And experience spans before, during, and after the meal. One last question. Hi. Um, so I, I understand you have a lot of data on where people go and what restaurants they visit. So there's obviously patterns. There's, if you visit X, X, Y, and Z, and there's a lot of people doing that. So people who visit X and Y, they probably will like to visit restaurant Z. How come there's no predictive uh, you know, technology that, well, no predictive feature that's sort of leading you there? Or is that on, in the pipeline? Um. We uh, try to look at those trends all the time. Um, uh, one thing that those trends would be uh, a bit skewing towards power users. Uh, so power users are the ones who dine you know, at least once a week and dine out on once a week. That population is not that big. Uh, a lot of people dine for special events, special occasions, and that doesn't come that frequently. So. Uh, from what we looked at so far, it's pretty hard to make that, that extrapolation from that power diner, diner population into the general population, which um, much more picky about when they would go and why would they go to certain places. We are experimenting, though, a lot in, pred in, predict in predictive models, uh, and uh, I think you'll, you'll see more things to come. Great. Well, uh, Joseph, thank you so much for being here. This was terrific. Thanks, guys.